China and Russia completely own the narrative now because they can sit and say, hey, see, the United States will abandon you whenever they decide yeah. and, um, and we'll leave you hanging. Uh, we won't do that. I know that that's not the case and they would if that ever came. In a heartbeat, yeah. <laughs> but they have that narrative, so it's a hard one to dispute right now based on what we did. Welcome to Old God Talks to Me, a podcast dedicated to helping guys create kick-ass lives for themselves and those that they love. Ladies, if you want to know what your guy is thinking, this podcast is for women too. Each week, a special guest helps you create that life you've imagined. We talk anti-aging medicine, personal growth, relationships and hot sex. Yeah, you hear me, getting laid more frequently other guy vices, and topics that many don't want to talk about but need to. Just because you're getting older doesn't mean you have to be old. Don't want to miss anything? Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review this podcast. And be sure to go to www.thestandard.academy forward slash magazine and grab a free copy of our new digital magazine. The Standard Academy, where we talk about erogenous zones, growing hair back, and other things that will help you create that kick-ass life. Now get ready to listen up and share with friends. This is Orsi Official Old Guy at OldGuyTalksMe.com, a podcast dedicated to helping older guys create kick-ass lives for themselves and those they love. And sometimes that has to do well with current events because we don't live in a bubble. We don't live in a vacuum. And uh, it's been in the news for quite a while. Uh, a little bit died down lately, but it's still a big factor. And this has to do with that botched, botched withdrawal uh, of U.S. forces and their supporters from Afghanistan. And uh, it's unfortunate how this happened. So today I have Retired General David Hicks, who served 30 years as an Air Force fighter pilot and general officer retiring as a Brigadier General General on Air Force HQ staff in the Pentagon. As a Director of Strategy, Concepts, and Assessments, he led Air Force transformation by developing and synchronizing Air Force strategy and strategic planning efforts and assessing the alignment of planning products with strategic guidance. He commanded a squadron, a group, uh, and wing level, including two combat command tours leading multinational and multi-service forces. His duties history includes multiple combat Air Force flying assignments, including serving as an instructor and commander at the U.S. Air Force Weapons School. He has over 3,800 hours of flying, 125 combat missions plus, and has participated in Operation Southern Watch, Iraqi Freedom, Enduring Freedom, and Resolute Support. His most recent combat assignment was as commander of all U.S. NATO forces tasked with training, advising, and assisting the building of Afghanistan Airport. Um, so one of the things that you're working on right now is Operation Sacred Promise, which is a mission to honor the service and sacrifice of the Afghan Air Force and Army Special Mission Wing warriors and their families by supporting their transition from Afghanistan and helping them build new productive lives in the United States. OSP provides consular assistance and resettlement support, including housing and basic life needs, job placement, language training, and cultural acclimation, in addition to ongoing advocacy and awareness efforts. Um, so welcome. Welcome to, welcome to Old Guy Talks Me. Thanks, sir. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Great to have a chance to uh, chat a little bit about what we're doing, uh, what we're doing and uh, kind of where we've been. Yeah, I was in, in reading this. I the, the, the word uh, their transition uh, certainly. I, I, I'll say that really understates what you are doing. <laughs> that because uh, uh, I had the opportunity to hear you speak at a, at a, at a luncheon meeting a few weeks ago, and uh, it, it's there, there's a lot to it. And so let's just start off as what is your organization doing to support those Afghans and their families? that were deserted to get out and the ones that you were able to get out. Yeah, it's funny you say that. I think uh, transition may be the, the understatement of the century when, it, when we're talking about what we're trying to do with these uh, Air Force members and their families. Um, you know, so what we're doing right now, the organization is, is uh, Operation Sacred Promise. We've got about 150 to 160 all volunteer members. Uh, a lot are retired military. Uh, there's a substantial number that are still active duty. And then we also have a, a lot of uh, civilians that are part of the organization. And we kind of have 
two different main efforts, I guess you would say. One effort is trying to keep the families that are still in Afghanistan alive and well um, with what they're doing. And then also one arm of the organization is taking care of the families once we're able to get them here to the United States. We're trying to get them resettled and literally starting a new life from scratch. So think of everything from basic living needs to job training, job opportunities, uh, language training for the family members that don't know English, uh, potential education training, you know, anything that, you know, I kind of use the, the uh, comparison. Think if, uh, think if you woke up tomorrow and you were in Mongolia and you had nothing but the clothes on your back and you had to start a new life. Um, that's where these, uh, that's where these families are and kind of, uh, what we're dealing with and trying to think through how we're going to take care of them, I guess, is the best way of saying it. Yeah, I'd like to spend a little time, and I want to get back to the ones that, that you actually already have here or in other countries and, and talk about that. But I want to talk about the, the, the people that have been left in country, in Afghanistan. Um, and, and I know that there's going to be certain things that I might ask that, that for operational purposes, you're not going to be able to answer. And that, that I certainly, certainly get that. And, and I certainly would not want to anyone uh, getting any ideas. Um, what... Is there, a, is there a number that you can tell us of people that are still there or is that, or is that kind of still something that you can't tell us? No, we can give general terms. Right now, our database, um, we have in our database that we're tracking about 10,000 individuals and families total. Um, that is, of that 10,000, 2,000 of them, or right around 2,000 of them, we can vouch for, we can vet, we've got their paperwork done um, because we have direct individuals on our team that can vouch for those family members and you know we work directly with them. Mm -hmm. The other 8,000 we have in the database, we're in the process of doing that vetting and vouching process. We just have, you know, we have to find either former um, advisors that worked with them or former folks that worked with them that can that can vouch for those individuals and, and you know and their associated families so you know in our mind this is going to be a very uh, a long long process of uh, trying to get what we call the right people out of Afghanistan um, because most of these folks that we're talking about uh, a number of them a great number of them trained here in the United States they know English uh, they work shoulder to shoulder with us. Uh, you know, we flew with them or we were on the flight line with them um, day in and day out. So, uh, you know, we think that we think in our eyes, at least, uh, if anybody's deserving to come here and try to have a chance of starting a new life, it's it's these folks because they put their faith, trust and confidence in us uh, in their country uh, to do what they were doing. Yeah. So when you talk about vetting, um, is the threshold something at the state department or some other agency that you have to vet to, to be able to bring these people into the into the united states or, or get i guess the first part is really getting them out of the country is a real challenge yeah that, that first that is the first challenge is getting them out of country and, and to get them out of country though they do have to be vetted with the right paperwork with the right identifications there's different recommendation letters you know that, that have to be written um on, on the individuals or, the, or, you know, as we pull them out. So that's mm -hmm. the big thing is making sure they have the right documentation with them physically. Um, and then we have the right information and the ability to push that documentation to the state department so they can, you know, run it through the official governmental vetting process, mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, either get them on a manifest on an airplane to come home or at least get them in, hopefully get in line uh, to do that. Yeah. Now, are there so they can't leave Afghanistan or like go to a neighboring country unless they have these papers or, or can these can this paperwork be done? Uh, let's say if they're they're in, in Pakistan or some other country, a neighboring country there. They could go to a third country. The The difficulty with that is, is are they legally going to that third country or not? Mm -hmm. And, you know, does does the individual or their family have the proper? Or visas, or do they have the proper to say get into Uzbekistan or Tajikistan or or Pakistan? Because if they enter those countries illegally, then they're at the whim of whatever the the government of that respective country wants to do with them. And um, so you know that's a 
that's a challenge because everything we're doing with the family members, we want to be legal and on the up and up uh, as far as what we're trying to do um, okay. day in and day out. So that's, uh, you know, we, we do not advise and recommend anything like that uh, for them. And we do not want to put them at, you know, what would be potentially you know, greater risk. Ultimately, it's their it's their decision. We can only advise as best we can if they think they have a different path or another path to uh, being less at risk. Um, you know, we don't control them. We can't say no. Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I, I've heard recently there are some news reports that that uh, people not answering with uh, Pakistan with the appropriate paperwork were basically taken back to the border and turned over to the Taliban. That is, uh, Pakistan changed their rules. Uh, I believe it was effective November the 5th, if you were in Pakistan illegally, uh, you ran the risk of being deported back to whatever country you came from. Obviously, that was aimed at um, Afghanistan because so many people were flowing or trying to flow across the border uh, without the proper visa paperwork and everything for, uh, for Pakistan. Yeah. Um, we hear so many conflicting reports. Uh, is the U.S. government being helpful or not? Or are they, are they putting up roadblocks or, or, or is it depends on who you get? It, it's, uh, you know, it's a real struggle to answer that question. I'll say that, you know, my, my biggest disappointment with everything that, that happened or how it played out going back to August when we, when we as an organization spun up and started, you know, doing what we're doing was the obvious lack of a plan um, to evacuate anybody, um, you know, that's when the, the Afghan, our Afghan counterparts in the Air Force and the Special Mission Wing started kind of reaching out desperately there in the middle of August to, to the advisors that, you know, they had kept in contact with over the years saying, you know, what can you do to help us? And we started kind of asking around what is being done to help these folks. And there was nothing and there was no plan to do anything to help them. And so we just kind of shook our heads, rolled our sleeves up and started figuring it out and, you know, working with uh, different members of Congress and media and, and ultimately the Department of State and, uh, and trying to get after uh, taking care of these folks as best we could, at least. Yeah. Um, you know, it, so it was frustrating that there was no plan. Then it's been very frustrating at times at how fast uh, they've been able to evolve or change the plan. Um, and, uh, so that has been, uh, a challenge and again, primarily rests with, the, with the department of state. Um, you know, we've changed the forms that have needed to be turned in and the, you know, different thing, different documentation that needs to be turned in three or four or five times. Um, I can't speak as to why, uh, you know, they've, they've had to change it that much other than it's a real pain in the butt when you've got as many as, as we have and some of the other NGOs have that are trying to get out, just one small change in documentation requirement um, puts a great amount of work on, on the team. Sure, oh yeah. Done in a timely fashion. So yeah, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been a disappointment, I, I would say is probably the biggest thing. I know they were thrown a massive task and they've been thrown a massive task to try to solve or, or get after uh, this problem, but you would think that we would be able to pivot better than we have. Um, and that's, you know, I kind of say that that's one of the, one of the real weaknesses of a bureaucracy. They're so big and big and bulky that uh, making quick changes and quick pivots in, in decision-making or policy uh, is almost impossible. Yeah. So apparent, uh, the uh, cooperation between the Afghan Air, Air Corps uh, to support the government of Afghanistan began in 2005. Tell us a little bit about who these people are that, that you, that, and, and who, you know, what they've done that makes you want to go to such extreme efforts to basically bring, bring them to safety. You know, the, the Afghan Air Force and the Afghan Special Mission Wing, uh, obviously they, we stood up or we started back uh, trying to build an Afghan Air Force there in the, in the mid 2000s. Uh, when I was in Kandahar in 2010, uh, as a commander of U.S. forces there, um, I had a chance to go over and meet, you know, my Afghan counterparts. We were just getting started, they were just getting started with 
you know, building the Afghan Air Force. So it's flying MI-17s and some uh, small little Cessna C-208s and, and a few other aircraft. Um, and then during the last 10 years, it really started to, to blossom and, and take off as far as um, getting the right individuals trained and then getting them with the right mentality and the right culture to, to, to fight, uh, I guess you'd say is the best way of putting it. So the special mission wing is kind of like the Afghan special air force. So our terms in the air force, we call, you know, we call it in the U S AFSOC, um, which is, you know, air force special ops command. That's what the special mission wing was in Afghanistan or a, a, a counterpart to it. So these folks that we got, you know, they're obviously, I'll say, more technical, more educated in nature because, you know, they're flying the aircraft or they're maintaining the aircraft. So we kind of built a culture with them where we were very close uh, in the training. And we did something that uh, most of the other services didn't do training wise is we stood up some some squadrons that, uh, and one squadron in particular, that would be responsible for training the Afghans here in the uh, United States. And this is for the A-29, which is what a, a primary airplane I was an instructor in uh, over there in 2016. But the same instructors that trained him, them here in the U.S., when the Afghans went back over to Afghanistan, those same instructors would be doing three-month rotations in Afghanistan while they were while the Afghans were flying combat. So they already knew us. They already had a relationship with us. We had a relationship with them. So there was a, a lot of trust that was already built into the, the culture that we were building and doing with the uh, Afghan Air Force. And that made them, you know, the Afghan Special Mission Wing and the Afghan Air Force are certainly, or were certainly two of the really good news stories out of Afghanistan, as far as success stories that we had mm -hmm. uh, with uh, the, the military. Um, I can't speak as much for the Afghan National Army as far as what they did and how they did advising. But for us, we did advising from the highest level to the lowest level. So it was nothing for me to fly a mission with a, with a young captain in the Afghan Air Force in the morning. And in the afternoon, I would go meet the Afghan Air Force Chief of Staff in his office. Uh, on the same, you know, on the same base because we live with uh, we live with the Afghans inside their base, so we did it from the highest level to the lowest level with all of our with all of our members, and it proved to be an effective formula. And I know for the special mission wing, it was the same way, which they were right across the ramp uh, from us. So we worked together a lot, but you know, a pretty talented group of individuals and a pretty motivated group of individuals, which is why we are pretty pretty adamant or pretty passionate about trying to get them out and, and take care of them. Yeah. You, you mentioned a word that the, you, the, you and they developed a level of trust between each other. Um, when things start to unravel and then they start to unravel very quickly, what, ha what would you say happened to that trust? And I'm not talking about the trust that you had with them, but they put a certain amount of trust in the government of the United States, uh, and and I, you know, given your, your efforts and all you're trying to do, uh, you have not violated that trust. But personally, I feel I feel the government, U.S. government, violated that trust. I, I it, it, it actually, it it really pisses me off. I mean, it it, it just uh, I just can't imagine uh, someone who has said, okay, I'm going to be a supporter, I'm going to help you, I'm going to help you fight the enemy, all of that. And then to be just like let go, and for me, I said I think that this portends very poorly for not just this, but if we ever have to go into other situations, why would anyone ever cooperate with the United States government? Yeah, and that's uh, you know that's the <clears throat> I'll say that's the thing we had the most difficulty with as far as the most of the folks that are in the organization were like, how can this how can this be happening? you know, with no plan to, to take care of these folks because they did trust us and they trust us now that we're, you know, doing everything we can to try to mm -hmm. try to get as many out as possible. So they, I'll say they trust us, but the trust in the U S government is, um, is certainly not what it, what it was or what it used to be. And the thing that you're right on a, 
on a bigger picture level, the thing that bothers me or concerns me the most is we have a lot of countries all around the world that are sitting on the fence right now as to whether they want to be allied or friendly to us or allied or friendly to say a China or a Russia or somebody that we would consider a, you know, a possible adversary or somebody sure. that thinks different than us. And so China and Russia completely own the narrative now because they can sit and say, Hey, see the United States will abandon you whenever they decide yeah. and, um, and we'll leave you hanging. Uh, we won't do that. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I know that that's not the case and they would, if that ever in a heartbeat, yeah. but, <laughs> but they have that narrative. So it's yeah. a hard one to dispute right now based on what we did. Right. They, they still haven't done it, but we did. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the evidence is we know for sure, at least, um, at this point that that's what's happening. Do you need accountability? Are you looking to change the course of your life but have failed to keep on track? Too often we take in information and fail to act. Do you need an accountability program to stay the course? Then go to www.thestandard.academy and find out about my accountability program that goes with my course that helps you find out what you want, why you want it, and how to get it. The accountability program keeps you on track to get results. You get, you're getting these people out and slowly, and I was, I was surprised by the number when you said like, you know, 2000 vetted and, and another 8,000. I was, I was, I was, and, and, that, and that's just from your particular right. uh, uh, area. That's not talking about across other branches of, 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 service that have you know have also had people that assisted them on the ground whatever so so yes. that number is huge which leads me to the, the question of the you know everybody's like not everyone so people in the administration are like going, oh we got one hundred twenty thousand people out who are these people that they got out uh that's kind of the uh... That's kind of the great unknown uh, to some extent, because um, we saw folks that were getting out or getting in to HKIA, the, the Kabul International Airport, um, and they had no affiliation with the government. They had no affiliation with the U.S. government or the U.S. military or, you know, any of the coalition partners or anything. And they were, you know, getting on planes and getting out. I don't know what or how they are being treated. I don't know how they're being vetted um, here in the U.S. because um, I'm assuming a substantial portion of them made it here to the United States. Mm -hmm. So I have no clue um, really where or how or what they're doing to say those individuals and families are, you know, belong in the U.S. or they are you know, deserve to be in the U.S., certainly when you compare it to the ones that, you know, we're trying to work with and we're trying to get out. So it really, uh, it really pisses us off, I guess, is the best way of saying it. Sure. That, you know, that we weren't able to get more out in that initial phase. We, we got a lot, but we weren't able to get more because we had the folks at the gate and they could get in, but, or, you know, they couldn't get in um, because and of the other folks. Yeah. So now who controlled the gates and, and why were some people able to get it that had no business being on these planes were able to get past the gates and other people that had papers were not able to get past the past the, 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 the guards at the gate. What, what was that all about? Yeah. So it was, a, you know, a lot of it early on, the, the U.S. controlled a lot of the a lot of the main gates. But if you if you look at uh, Hamid Karzai International Airport, HKIA, there's a number of gates that were available um, to be opened or, you know, be manned. And the U.S. just didn't have the enough forces there to man them all 24-7, given the chaos that was going on. So they allowed the uh, Afghan um, National Directorate of Security, NDS, so think of them as kind of a combination of FBI and CIA. Uh, they allowed them to man uh, a number of the gates. And so what happened was... Uh, it became essentially a little bit of a pay for play uh, mm -hmm. to get into some of these gates. You know, if you had enough money or you knew the right or you knew the right people, 
um, which is maybe new the right folks in these uh, for these NDS organizations, um, you could get your family in no problem. Um, you know, if you had you know one to three thousand dollars per person, or if you, like I said, you were part of the right tribe that was uh, with the tribe that was the guards manning the gate, you could get in. Mm -hmm. uh, our folks, a lot of our folks, could not get in for that reason. We didn't know that it was going to become a something where you literally had to pay to pay to get inside, and our families didn't have the money to do that anyway. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's horrible, and that's um, but that's what happens you know when you have a uh, uh, a uncontrolled refugee problem i, I know that uh, not to be off this pro project but uh my parents escaped from uh, ukraine uh, uh they were kind of in that little zone between the advancing soviet army and the retreating nazi army and they did they they did a lot of pay for play i mean they they brought they bribed their way uh in, into austria literally uh, in, in a lot of situations, and, and, and it, it, it's just something that's a reality of it. Um, yeah. And that, you know, and God bless them. And I, I hope, uh, I hope, and I pray, you know, that the the folks that didn't have an affiliation with the U.S. government, or the U.S. military, turn out to be, you know, good citizens and whatnot. It just, I don't know how you, I don't know how you can vet or vouch for them if it's literally somebody you've never seen, never met. You know don't know, you know, have any interaction with yeah. U.S. personnel. Yeah. So time will tell on that. Um, yeah. And I totally get it, too. I, I agree with you. And I know there's always going to be things like that, situations like this. Yeah, yeah but it, it's just, uh, you know, it, it's, it's it's interesting, though. I, I, will, I will tell you, I do have concerns that uh, because of uh, the uh, violent crime that exists in Europe. And, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of it is actually Afghani. Yeah. And um, and and so uh, disproportionately so, and and so uh, uh, I have a feeling we're going to be seeing that here in the United States. Um, so there's a lot of discussion on TV because uh, Bagram Air Base <laughs> should that have been closed or should that have been kept open or uh, it, it seemed like it was a no brainer to keep it open. But maybe I'm maybe I'm not I'm not a military person. So uh, what's what's your what's, what's your perspective on that? Well, you know, there's there's two trains of thought. Um, if you're going to keep a substantial footprint on the ground there, so let's say you're going to keep 2,500 or 3,000 people, uh, maybe maybe more than that, if you had a plan for the actual drawdown. So that means you had to have mapped this out over a number of months, as opposed to just putting a date on the calendar and saying we're going to be gone by here. Um, I would say with my strategic mind, that if you had a plan in place and it was going to be a number of months to draw it down, that you would absolutely want to keep Bagram open because it had been a U.S. base for 20 years. We knew the base like the back of our hand. We knew how to guard it. It was away from Kabul, uh, you know, about 20 miles north of, of Kabul. I don't even know if it's that far as the crow flies, maybe only like 15 miles. Um, so you had an ability, a unique ability to operate a base that we were uniquely familiar with. Um, the only issue with that is everybody you were trying to move coming out of Kabul then had to make their way up to the base there. So by road or by helicopter or whatever the case may be. So, you know, logistically that could create a problem, but if you've got a plan laid out and you're going to do it over the course of months, as far as evacuating folks, um, then that would, that'd probably be the smart way to do it. Um, if you're at a last minute you know, kind of Rome is burning situation, which is kind of what we devolved into when we, when this happened. Um, H. Kaya probably is the better option because you don't have that distance to travel to get up to, mm -hmm. uh, to get up to Bagram. Um, and also, you know, we were putting back in forces at the last minute there to try to guard the gates. But everything I've always seen with what we call NEO or non-combatant evacuation operations is you try to get the civilians out first before you pull the military out. We pulled the military out and closed down Bagram. Yeah, yeah. Then we started trying to get the civilians out. Then we had to put the military back in to try to do that. Um, so we kind of did it backwards um, from every plan that I've <laughs> ever seen. Um, so yeah, I would say uh, Bagram would have been the smarter option if you had planned this out, but once we got 
got into the kind of nightmare scenario of um, doing everything on the fly, uh, HKIA became about the only option. Yeah. So much has been said about, uh, you hear it like, oh, they're gonna be able to use it. They're not gonna be able to use it. What, what's, what's your take on the status of the equipment, the planes, the helicopters and all of that, that was, that was left, not, not to mention the, I mean, they're, they're the best armed in, in terms of rifles. <laughs> they got the, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, they're, they're not shooting muskets anymore. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> They've got some good stuff there now. They've got some really good stuff, and you can't tell who they are now because they're all they all got fatigues just like everyone else. Yeah. Uh, so, what's the status of of the, the uh, air equipment that, that was left back there? Is, is is that is it just so hard to maintain that it's non usable or some of it usable or, or what's the status of that? So, uh, some of it, you know, the the Afghan Air Force as as Kandahar got overrun in the week leading up to. Kabul being overrun ultimately. They flew, uh, the Air Force guys flew as much as they could get out of Kandahar up to Kabul, mm -hmm. uh, but that wasn't everything. So we know there was some operational, uh, probably C 208 aircraft and some operational helicopters that were left down there that weren't um, disabled. There were some down there that were, were also disabled. So, you know, they probably won't fly again. In Kabul, the aircraft and helicopters that were left there were almost all disabled by certain means to, to keep the Afghans from, or uh, to keep the Taliban from being able to fly. Okay. And then we got, um, you know, as we were talking to the, to the leadership, uh, the Afghan Air Force leadership, they were able to get about 60 to 65 aircraft and helicopters out of country to Uzbekistan and Tajikistan um in the last couple of days as the as Maza Sharif base was falling in the north part of the country and as Kabul was falling so yeah. you know they flew and they fought until they ran out of runways to land on and that's not an exaggeration you know one of the so you said the, they about about 60 that's about how, out of how many is that roughly uh I think if we include I think they had all of the UH-60s I I can't quote a specific number because they had more aircraft and equipment flow in since I was there as a commander. Mm -hmm. I would say it was probably out of roughly 200, maybe 200. Okay. Right. So it was a substantial amount that, you know, we're able to, to get evacuated out or, or pulled out of there. Okay. Um, Want to switch gears here to talk about what you're doing with the people that are, have gotten out of country and you are working to resettle them here in the United States. So, when you when somebody like uh, I want to hear about what you guys are doing, but tell me about what are the aspirations of the people that are that that have recently arrived here in the United States. You know, and, and I, I, I obviously I can't speak for uh, the others that are arriving here in country that aren't you know we don't uh, work with, but you know by and large the ones that are that are coming from the Afghan Air Force they're motivated. Uh, and excited and incredibly grateful to have a chance to start a new life. And um, so, you know, with the pilots, uh, for example, a lot of them want to keep flying and a lot of them want to, uh, you know, fly here in the United States. There's a number of them that are interested in joining the Air Force here. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll see how things, see how we're able to work things out. Um, I was just on the phone with, uh, with uh, one of the senior pilots for one of the airlines right before we started started this podcast uh, talking about training opportunities and how we can get some of these guys into the pipeline to to have a chance to fly commercially here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And just yesterday, we spent money to get uh, two of the pilots uh, their U.S. certifications based on their flight time in Afghanistan and their flight time with us uh, to get their U.S. Certifications to get them uh, into the opportunities to to fly here in the United States commercially. So everything from that to you know if they weren't if for the non pilots uh, folks that are here, anything they're interested in doing is is on the table. There's it's surprisingly a number of them want to go and uh, learn how to be a truck driver, which we've got a massive shortage of. Yes, <laughs> you know, and it's interesting. One of the pilots that. Uh, that got off the plane uh, a few weeks ago at Holloman Air Force Base to go in the camp there. One of our guys um, that's part of the group 
met him, you know, was also his advisor. So knew him personally, obviously from Afghanistan. And they were talking about, you know, what do they want to do uh, here in the U S and a few of the guys said they wanted to go into flying. A couple said they wanted to start their own business, like a coffee shop or an Afghan uh, restaurant or, you know, things like that. And they're very entrepreneurial, at least our folks that, that we're working with there have a very entrepreneurial and, and grateful mindset. And one of them said, I know you have a truck driving shortage in the U S I'm going to start a trucking company. And I, I thought it was, I just, I couldn't help but laugh because I thought it was so cool. Here these guys are, they've just been through hell and back trying to get out of Afghanistan and then going through and, you know, getting over to the United States. And they're already talking about a, a business that they want to start based off of a need here in the U S and then two of the other guys immediately said, and I want to go live in Tennessee because it has one of the best tax locations in the U S <laughs> uh, I'm like, holy cow. I can't, I mean, it just, for me, it was, it was refreshing to see them actually thinking, talking, and obviously had been discussing it with each other of what they wanted to do, where they wanted to go and how they literally wanted to start a new life from scratch. So, you know, for us as an organization, that's pretty, pretty motivating motivational for us to keep at it and, and keep working for them to to give them the opportunities here in the U.S. So, you know, the the foundation, that's what we're doing. We're trying to help them find job opportunities. We're helping them uh, with basic living needs. So, you know, there may be times where I can do something so simple as provide them, uh, put some uh, money into an account for an Amazon account they have as to get strollers, food, basic necessities at a, you know, wherever they're living now. So we're trying to augment any of the government programs because those pro programs are very short and temporary. So we're trying mm -hmm. to, we're trying to fill gaps, I guess is the best way of putting it for, for basic living needs. Then again, that job opportunity piece. And then we know we're going to need to work on uh, educational opportunities, uh, language training for the family members, maybe that don't know English, uh, things like that. So we're, we're pretty, you know, it's kind of an open book and, and it seems we're building the airplane as we're flying it, uh, mm -hmm. as far as sure. what we need to do and, and how we need to help them. And every day there's a different challenge today. We got some great news because the organization today was, uh, confirmed as a, uh, a nonprofit public charity by the IRS. So we're officially a, what's called a five, 501 C three organization now for, uh, for donations, which again, that's, that's and, really good news for us. Yeah, and, and what's the website somebody wants to donate? It is uh, op, op, sacred promise. So all one word, op sacred promise dot org. Okay. Or, and uh, you know, so uh, so that so folks, that's you can go there to donate, and also uh, if there's a, is there any kind of a, a connecting people with uh, uh, job opportunities, and they, let's say you've got if somebody here has a business, and they they say, okay, I want to hire some of these people. Uh, is there opportunities that, through your website to do that, or is that still something in the makes? You know, and again, that's one of those works in progress. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a contact us tab on the current website. Okay. You know, that that email comes directly to me. Uh, so I'm, you know, working it and then I'll disperse it out to the team, depending on what it is or what, you know, either the asset is or what they have or what opportunities they potentially have. Um, and then we discuss it and we talk about it. You know, I've been... I've been in the media quite a bit, um, kind of, you know, doing this to, to be the, the face of the organization. So everybody on the team that's really doing the real work in the organization can, can stay focused on the, I'll say the tactical efforts inside mm -hmm. of the country and the, and the tactical efforts of taking care of the families here. Um, and I just try to, I try to bang the drum, I guess, the best I can to, to, to show everyone what the need is and kind of, and what we're doing. The website's pretty basic right now, but it's about to get a heck of a lot bigger. Um, we're Perfect. about to uh, unveil a much bigger website that has a lot more of the news and uh, a lot more detailed information as far as what we're doing and where we're going. Um, we have, uh, gosh, I've been New York Times a couple of times, uh, or been in the New York Times a couple of times with this, uh, on Anderson Cooper a couple of times. Reuters has written probably six or seven articles. Um, great. Uh, we've got a great partner. Wonderful. ABC's done the same thing. So, um, you know, it's really about getting the word out of these. And again, I can only speak to our, our families that we're trying to take care of. These are 
great, great people. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. Uh, because sure. the the team is literally uh, we're all volunteers. So you know, every minute we spend doing this is it a minute away from our family, uh, a minute away from whatever we're doing on our time where we're not doing our day job, I guess you would say. And um, so I'd like to know where I can send the invoice for for our organization to the government. <laughs> Sure. Pretty sure I'm never going to find yeah, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. You well, know, there's all this money that's coming out there. You know, they yeah. you should be, just get in line. Uh, <laughs> get them. Yeah. yeah, no, no. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'll show my colors here. Yeah. Actually, what you need to do is you need to you need to put in uh, instead of uh, uh, OP sacred promise, you should put green op sacred promise there you go <laughs> i like that <laughs> and uh and there you go and, you know you're you're pretty close to the front of the line then uh <laughs> exactly. it might bump us up yeah so well you know what first of all thank you for your service and uh not to be trivializing this uh, you're, you're doing god's work you're doing work that 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 our government failed to do that should have been done. And in, in a lot of ways, I'm embarrassed and ashamed about our government and what's happened. And I feel very sorry for these people. And uh, I'm sure glad that, that you and your team and your group is, and other groups also doing this with other different branches of, of uh, Afghan forces are, are they're stepping up. And uh, so I want to make sure everyone uh, goes that there's going to be a, a, a link in the program notes that you take you uh, to, the, to the website so you can donate. Or if you have jobs, if you have stuff that you can give, all that stuff is, is needed uh, for people resettling here in the United States. And these are good people. These are ambitious people. They're, in, they're not looking for a permanent handout. They're just looking for a way to just get by until they, they get on their own feet and, and start to uh, being a part of the American dream. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. You know, we feel like, uh, we feel like we have a commitment to them, uh, to do this, uh, to try to get them off to a good start, um, in a, in literally a new life from scratch. Cause most of them came over here with nothing but the clothes on their backs. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, as they got out of country and, um, if, if we can't use, uh, anything, be it jobs or, or supplies or anything, I'm working with enough, enough other NGOs, I know we can hand it off to somebody who can use it, uh, you sure. know, whatever it may be. Um, and we'll keep getting after it, but, you know, thanks so much. The team is, the team is just amazing. It's an, it's an honor to be a part of such a, a great group of Americans uh, that are doing this. Yeah. Well, it's an honor to have you here on our program. Thank you. So this is Oris, the official old guy at oldguytalksme.com. Remember, it's all about creating a kick-ass life for yourself and those that you love. Until next time, and be sure to share, subscribe, rate, and review. And if you write me a bad review, I don't care. Just don't ignore me. Take care. Thank you for joining Dr. Oris and his incredible guest. Like what you heard and learned? Then be sure to do three things. One, subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Two, share this with someone who may need to hear it. Three, leave a review and rate this podcast. Opt in at www.thestandard.academy forward slash magazine and get our free digital magazine with savings, articles, and deeper dives into cool controversy. Be the guy who takes action. Without action, you're not going to get the results you want. Thank you again and make it a great day.